Hello, everyone. Welcome again to Civil Seminar. Today, we have um, Ruth Hudson and Sebastian Grenier from SICA Group. Um, and they're here to talk about their work on um, carbon fiber reinforced concrete. And Bruce was just telling me that he graduated from Weston in 1992. So welcome back. I brought my cane so that I could uh, mobilize around the room as well. Thank you, everybody. Okay, thank you, Bing. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you. Uh, as Bing mentioned, I uh, am a Western grad of economics and political science in 92. I uh, hope you don't mind. I, I brought the purple for uh, for effect and, and a couple of laughs and a couple of smiles and kind of warm the audience up a little bit. All right. How's your day going? Awesome. Okay. My name is Bruce Hudson. I've been with Seek Canada for just uh, two weeks ago. I celebrated 30 years in the business. And uh, my role is a technical advisor, sales representative. Uh, my Most of my day is consulting with architects and engineers and helping them develop specifications for the projects that they are working on. Uh, there's many disciplines to SICA. Uh, show of hands, have you got any any ideas, SICA? Have you heard the name, what we do? Heard the, uh, a couple of yes, a couple of no, mostly no's. SICA is a global company. Uh, we manufacture products in the construction industry, anything from roofs to basement foundation waterproofing. Uh, it's, a, it's a company that was formed in 1910 in Switzerland. And uh, today is uh, home to uh, 10 billion in, in, in uh, Swiss franc sales and uh, 50,000 employees worldwide. Um, Sebastian is uh, my co-presenter today. Uh, Sebastian has an engineering background. I have the economics and political science background, plus the School of Hard Knocks out on construction sites dealing with future engineers. Uh, on these sites, and uh, and that's, uh, that's 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 my role. So, Sebastian, I'll let you uh, say hello to yourself. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, as you will notice, to my accent, I'm from France. So, I joined Sika Canada two years ago. I was working at Sika France before. My specialty is on uh, structural strengthening. So, um, I will present you new technologies that we have uh, with these uh, FRP materials. And uh, my work at SICA is to work 
closely with Bruce uh, on technical aspects. So I'm working at the technical department at CICA Canada. Okay, thank you. As mentioned, just, just so that I give you a little bit of background of who we are, uh, what company you're being talked to when you get out into the field, you will hear of CICA. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is a, uh, a specialist company uh, uh, of uh, construction chemicals, anything from roofing to, to flooring, to structural grout, to carbon fiber reinforcement materials, which we're focusing our talk on today. And uh, we have manufacturing plants throughout the world uh, and a number of them in Canada as well. Uh, Montreal is our head office and uh, research and development manufacturing facility uh, with locations in Edmonton, uh, Cambridge, and uh, Oakville is where my office is out of. Uh, but uh, so it's uh, it's across can across Canada as well. well was, sorry. Nope. Oh. But as I mentioned, SICA has multi-disciplines and uh, we have uh, concrete our business units, which we describe as concrete production. These are the admixtures that go into ready mix concrete to increase the flow, to provide air in the concrete when you're building a structure. So that's part of our group. Uh, STM, we were talking about that at lunch, shotcrete tunneling and mining. So uh, mortars that go to line the tunnel after they've been excavated, whether that's uh, a uh, a mining application or whether it's a um, uh, transit application for for uh, for the tunnel. Uh, roofing, the Rogers Center where the Blue Jays play, that roof is a Sika roof. Uh, industry, this is uh, planes, trains, and automobiles bonding systems. So we would have uh, urethane adhesives which would bond components onto buses, trucks, rail cars. Uh, uh, that, uh, that, that's known as our industry group. Concrete refurbishment, which is what Sebastian and I are a part of. So this could be anything as simple as a concrete repair that goes on to concrete to structurally uh, fix that concrete to the FRP materials that we're talking about today. And then flooring is another division to SICA that uh, you will find in institutional uh, universities where washrooms, uh, corridors, uh, decorative and, and decorative systems for uh, seamless flooring in the epoxy nature. Carbon fiber. Uh, uh, fiber reinforced polymers, familiar, familiar phrase to you, talked about it during course of studies at all, or is this completely new? Some head nods, so you kind of know a little bit about what we're talking about, yeah. The question, or you, you can fire questions away if you want, but two, but no, no rules here. Okay, so in a nutshell, uh, we're talking about carbon fiber technology used in the retrofit of existing structures uh, of, of, of a concrete element. So as you can see in that graphic up there on the upper right side, there's a number of applications such as the underside of the slab, uh, column wrapping with, uh, with a wrap system, uh, punched openings. So in a nutshell, these are used as an alternative to concrete or steel to structurally upgrade a concrete member. In times such as when a lot of these structures were built in the 1950s, for example, a bridge, for example, the traffic loads weren't what they were today. So there's sometimes there's considerations on our bridge and infrastructures where we need to structurally upgrade that element. And we can do that, as I mentioned, in a number of ways, whether it's uh, adding concrete or adding more steel, uh, but in this technology, we're adding carbon fiber reinforcement. Just uh, a little about the presentation. It, uh, I'm going to start off with about you know, what this product is and how, they're, how it's made, actually. Yeah. And uh, we'll, then we'll talk about the product uses and the choices uh, that uh, we see in the field. And then a majority of the presentation is basically taking you through the uh, past 20 years of case histories that I, most of them that I've been involved with on the field. And it just shows you the different techniques and applications that can be used for uh, strengthening various structures. And Sebastian's gonna talk about uh, a little bit about software and a couple of the other technologies as well. Oops, sorry, I went backwards. So this product started out, starts out its life as a, um, as a strand. Uh, much like a nylon or a polyester, uh, these strands are uh, uh, synthetic in nature. 
and they go through a roving process like this. But for carbon fiber and the properties that these products exhibit in the field to give you added flexural strength, they use a strand which is called pan acrinyl trial. I think I've only said that once correctly in my life, and today wasn't the, the second time. So we call it PAN for short. So these are called PAN strands in the field. And uh, what these things do is there's millions of these individual strands. They're, they're about one-tenth the size of human hair. And when you bundle them all up together and package them in an epoxy matrix, you're yielding something that gives you high, high flexural strength when you bond it to the underside or around the column or around concrete. So once they go from this strand, they go through a heat aging process and they're fired at a uh, thousand degrees Celsius. And these things are cooked. You're changing the properties of these things and basically strengthening them to, uh, to a, a high degree. I mentioned uh, there's a human hair in comparison to one of these uh, pan strands. Uh, one individual one would be uh, you know, a one, one tenth roughly the size of the human hair. Okay, then this is just a little bit of processing that happens. They go through a treatment, the oxidation. Uh, there's there's various stages of temperature manipulation to the strand. And what winds up happening as it goes through this heat aging process, you start at the bottom, where those uh, those rovings that I showed earlier, and you work your way up to the characteristic black strand that you'll see uh, up at the top. Uh, that's just probably a few hundred uh, of those strands, but once you put these all together in uh, in a in a product, which we'll come to in a minute, there's literally millions of those individual strands running in parallel. And this is towards the end of the manufacturing process. The characteristic black. And these are all, again, these strands going through multiple roving processes, and they come out on a spool at the end. And then these are sent to other various manufacturers for different types of processing. Much like the steel business, they, they start out with uh, cooking, the, cooking the iron ore, putting it into a, into a sheet or into a, a roll, and then sending it off to other manufacturers for slitting, stamping, changing it into different products, nails, car parts, et cetera. So same idea with the carbon fiber world is we start out with the, with the strands, we get it into a roving like that, send it off to a manufacturer such as us, and then we, uh, we, manipulate, we manipulate it there for our intended uses. <laughs> this is, a, uh, this is a, just a fabric, almost like a, a roll of, a roll of uh, wallpaper, if you will. And then uh, we, can, we can take that and we can encapsulate it into an epoxy and come out with a strong uh, material such as this. And the, the, the illustration here is just to show you that these things, the real principle, the engineering principle behind using these products is to give you a very high tensile and flexural strength product. In our everyday world, these products are seen in all kinds of applications from uh, high performance uh, race cars, uh, even, even uh, everyday cars, you'll see carbon fiber within components of the car. Uh, the aerospace industry over the last 20 years has used these products for the construction of airplanes. Uh, fuel cell, Elon Musk and his, and his uh, SpaceX program is uh, uh, utilizing carbon fiber as the outer shell to contain the fuel to propel the rockets. Carbon fiber hockey sticks, of course, for, for sports enthusiasts, golf clubs, tennis rackets. Uh, other, than, other than the flexural strength that I think I've tried to illustrate here of, of what you're getting out of that, what's the other main ingredient or consideration that we're getting with the use of this carbon fiber technology? It has to do with weight in that it is low. So when we're trying to propel rockets and we're trying to propel planes and we're trying to propel a hockey stick at very strength, at very high rates of speed and greater distances, the less weight, the more, uh, the less force that we need to, to get the, that happening. So the big engineering principle behind the use of these technologies is it's a very lightweight material except, and it's extremely strong. In the construction world, which we're part of, and will be part of. 
these are the types of products that you'll see in the field when you uh, want to upgrade a column or you want to upgrade a slab on the underside of the slab, for example. So we have these things called carbon fiber plates, which you'll see here. We refer to this as a plate. See if that works. There we go. Yeah, I like that. Love technology. How bad for the old guy, huh? So we have a carbon fiber plate, and these are known as wraps here. This is a carbon fiber wrap. And then we have rods, which are uh, your lower left. And then we have L brackets. And the L brackets are predominantly used if you have to do some shear strengthening of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, um, of a beam, for example. The real principle behind all of this, again, is these products mimic the steel that you would ordinarily use either on the inside or the outside of the, of the structure. <laughs> Under microscope, uh, again, under microscope, these uh, fibers are running in parallel, and there's literally millions of them in a profile that might be 1.2 millimeters in thickness and, say, four, uh, um, 100 millimeters in width. So you could have 1.2 million individual strands of these fibers running in that geometric shape there. So you, you line all those up together, you encase this in an epoxy bath, and at the end of the day, you're, you're, you're giving yourself an extremely high flexural strength product. Okay, and in everyday structures, we've seen that picture before on the left, uh, but road, roads and bridges, uh, a lot of bridges uh, are going through uh, various needs of repair. Uh, I have an example of that coming up shortly. When we talk about these products, we also refer them to as composites, uh, like reinforced concrete. Reinforced concrete is a composite material. It's a composite composition of concrete and steel. And you get the compressive strength out of the, the concrete. You get the flexural strength out of steel. With carbon fiber technology, it's the same thing. We have, this time, we have an epoxy resin, which encapsulates and encases the carbon fiber fabric itself. And that's our composite material. So that is uh, that, that's uh, you'll you'll refer you'll hear the term composite when when we talk about these technologies, and that's what we're talking about when we when you say composite. So as I mentioned, I I, I stress that there's uh, different methods of reinforcing a, a structure uh, and, and different needs to it. But, uh, if we take a and I talked about weight earlier. We take a uh, beam that we want to upgrade. We want to structurally increase the, uh, the load capacity and the, the flexural capacity of that beam. There's traditionally three methods of doing it. So we can bond steel plate to that with bolts and, and heavy application of the, of, the, of, the, of the steel. We can add concrete. Of course, you're adding, with both these methods, we're adding a, 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 a amount of dead load to that structure. And then, uh, six pounds of load uh, over a, a single span of uh, 18 meters or so, 18 feet rather, six meters, um, we, we are adding a very lightweight material in the carbon fiber world. Design of these things, uh, there's a couple of uh, regulatory bodies that uh, these didn't used to have, but over the last 20 years, it has uh, grown. Uh, in Canada, we have the CSA, which is the CSA S806. Uh, and this, uh, the engineering community is looking to this as their guide on how to, when they're prescribing products and designing with these, with these, this technology. So they're referring to uh, CSA S806. In the U.S., S806 was born out of uh, ACI, which is American Concrete Institute, and there's a, a code there called the ACI 440, and this uh, is where the uh, basically the engineering of these products uh, was born out of the ACI 440. And again, as I said, this this took place roughly 20 years ago, and from the time that you had a you had a regulatory body and a and a code standard to uh, design with, uh, this was uh, this this really became uh, fast-moving uh, technology in the construction world. 
Okay, I mentioned plates earlier when I tried to do some scribbling. I, I, I say plates, again, just think in your mind, 1.2 millimeters in thickness by either two inches or, or 50 millimeters. Uh, these things uh, can range from 50 millimeters up to 150 millimeters in width. So the plates are used generally on the underside of a slab or a beam, and it will give you flexural capacity upgrade. Our, uh, our team here, it's a little bit difficult to see, but they're standing on a two inch by two inch board, concrete rather, with the carbon fiber plate bonded to the underside of it. Um, if you think of it and you have nothing else to do, type in Seek a Carbidur on YouTube and you'll see that little video and uh, be uh, thoroughly entertained, I trust me. Are they laughing? No, but they They will? Okay. At me. They're, they're laughing at me, though. <laughs> Not at my jokes. So, flexural uh, uh, NSM rods. So, that's near surface mounted rods. So, this would be used in negative moment uh, predominantly. So, if you are needing to reinforce a slab that's cantilevered on the negative side, on the negative moment, uh, we could introduce these uh, rods onto the top of the concrete slab. Uh, generally, what you're doing is you're cutting in a slot and you're inserting these rods into that slot. Again, uh, encasing everything in epoxy, such as that top, uh, top right picture there. And then you're uh, providing negative moment strengthening with this technology that way. Yes. Uh, you mean that we bury the, the part in top of the slabs? You will just the... so yeah. You know, the concrete and bury all of the, the part of the slab. So with this example, obviously, if you're cutting into the top side of the slab for negative moment strengthening, you have to have consideration for the for the rebar that's already in place. You can't be cutting. So this, this is an option if there is sufficient cover and the engineer has deemed that they can cut in, say, a quarter of an inch, for example, uh, to achieve that negative moment strengthening. Um, it is an evaluation on the site. There has to be some radar uh, survey that, that takes place of the structure to make sure that they're able to cut it in. There are other ways to do it. Um, we could also we could put those plates on top. I've done that before, we maybe groove it in. Uh, but uh, but these these require a little more uh, greater depth of of cutting into the structure when you're using that technology. <laughs> Okay, so we've got plates, we have NSM rods, near surface mounted rods, we have wraps. Uh, we've seen some pictures of the wraps, and the wraps are basically, if you think of hoop steel within a column, uh, this is mimicking hoop steel around a column. Uh, so wraps or, or, uh, or uh, the steel within a beam, uh, the hoop steel within the beam, uh, this would mimic that, tech, that, uh, that engineering. So the wraps go around a column or go around a beam to, again, increase, increase flexural capacity. And uh, uh, it's a different method than the plates or the, the NSM. And then finally, we have what's called L brackets, which, are, which would be related to the, to the plates themselves. And these, again, this is uh, similar. This is uh, uh, shear strengthening. And uh, it is intended so that you have a you have one L going this way on the on the underside of your beam, and you have the other L coming like this. So you're basically creating that U channel, U shape with the uh, with the plate system to give you that shear strengthening of a beam. Okay, so the, the next phase of this is uh, basically just walking you through some pres some. Uh, projects that I've been, most of these I've been involved with, and it just gives you some practical ideas of where these products have been used in the field and why. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll start off with Carbidur. That's our trade name, and uh, this is predominantly the plate system. Okay, so this is uh, for Torontonians. This is uh, Islington and Dundas Bridge uh, over the Etobicoke Creek. And that uh, structure underwent some lane expansion. And as I mentioned earlier with the graphic, uh, increased traffic loads over many years was starting to, this bridge was starting to show some fatigue after 50 years of service. 
Uh, there was a number of cracks in the concrete on the uh, on the underside, so those were injected to try and st structurally stitch the cracks and stitch that uh, concrete back together. And then on the underside, we did a a, a number uh, sixteen hundred lineal meters actually of of installation on the underside. Again, to to stiffen and to reinforce the underside of the bridge to structurally upgrade it. Okay, this just shows you some of the things that that happen on site. Is there's a mechanical preparation that takes place, uh, and then we do some bond testing. Uh, either the engineer or ourselves can do some bond testing to make sure that we have a substrate which is suitable for the bonding of the epoxy and the products onto the surface. Okay, the, the bond test, uh, want, we want to reveal that the concrete has sufficient strength in order to support the installation. So when we pull off, we do a tensile pull test of these materials, uh, we want to see a, a concrete cone failure such as this to indicate that the concrete is in good shape in order to, to receive the products. And more importantly, to engage the, the engineering that's, that's happening and engage the entire structure uh, with the incorporation of the carbon fiber. Okay, and then these are simply cut on site very easily. Uh, there's an epoxy layer adhesive which goes onto the underside. Those two lines are duct tape actually, just to, to show, just to control the uh, high-tech duct tape, right? High-tech duct tape. Uh, to control the the uh, the cleanliness, I guess, of the application, and 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 then uh, once they've applied a layer of epoxy adhesive onto the underside, and they construct this jig, and simply uh, deposit the epoxy paste onto the so the epoxy paste would have like a loose peanut butter consistency, and they dump it onto the uh, into this box, and push the material along, and it deposits the material onto the back side of that plate. And then the workers take it, and uh, this was, uh, I believe, a six, six. Uh, it was somewhere in the order of from here to the to the wall uh, was the the width. And so they had about four or five uh, workers lifting it in in place, very lightweight, as I mentioned, very easy to use. And then uh, they just simply marry the wet epoxy under the wet epoxy of the of the of the two that they've just applied. And then they hard roll it onto the surface and squeeze out the excess that, uh, that, uh, that to make sure that we have 100% contact of the, of the epoxy to the plate itself. So in principle, in the engineering world, we want to make sure that all of this is acting in unison, much like concrete and is bonded to steel. Everything's acting in unison. We're, we're trying to achieve the same thing when we're designing and, and applying these products. And the extremity of that bridge on the other side. Uh, so there's this just shows you the finished product. Uh, that was one of the lane additions. And uh, so this basically just uh, placed uh, uh, placed that product, uh, placed that bridge into a higher structurally low capacity uh, after the installation. Okay, uh, again, this famous, of course, uh, the Gardner Expressway uh, is... Uh, I don't want to scare you, but it's all held up with our carbon fiber uh, technology. So it's it's uh, a number of uh, a number of um, uh, programs were undertaken over the last several years, and uh, similar to the last example, the Gardner Expressway has a lot of uh, of this uh, material on the underside of it as well. Okay, there we go. There's uh, there's some heavy duty application there. We talked about a little bit on the, the top side. So this is a project in Oakville where there was uh, code compliance that they needed to upgrade where you had uh, uh, emergency vehicle access onto this. So this uh, this was excavated uh, and this was going to become a parking lot and, uh, and, and, and main uh, roadway for emergency vehicles. So you've got the fire trucks, the ambulance, the police, uh, all parking uh, here in the event of uh, an emergency. And with the loads that that can exhibit, the uh, engineering community decided that uh, this parking structure was not up to uh, grade uh, and they needed to reinforce the uh, top side of the slab. So what we're doing here is we're actually, and this is kind of the negative moment uh, uh, upgrading. 
On the top side of this slab, underneath this is where all the columns are, and then the capitals would be directly beneath the, the area that's that's chalked out there that you can see. So on the under, so we have our slab like this, we have our column underneath that. So we're 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 in the tension zone of the flexural of the of the concrete on the top side in this particular instance. This particular example is where we use both near sounded near surface mount rods as well as we couldn't dig into the concrete in some locations so we had basically just to put the plates in a checkerboard or tick uh, uh, crisscross pattern directly over the columns okay so there's a pretty heavy duty congestion of the, of the carbon fiber on the on the top side in that example okay and then there's same thing but in this location, we were able to utilize the near surface mounted rods. And again, okay, from that point on, we did some waterproofing uh, and then they re, re uh, paved that area with the typical asphalt paving. So what we did here is obviously we didn't interrupt the uh, process of doing the waterproofing in the paving with a very thin profile material we're able to utilize this technology uh, as opposed to if you tried to add steel and that it could have been uh, could have been a different uh, different uh, uh, different way of doing trying to, to upgrade that structure. Uh, the subject of fireproofing of these materials always comes up and uh, there is a technology out there called secret 213F, which we will basically spray directly onto the carbon fiber itself to uh, give you a, a UL rating of four hours at a certain thickness so that you basically give the occupants an opportunity to get out of the structure uh, before, uh, before collapse. Okay, and basically that's you know not unlike what you'd see in uh, other applications of protecting steel as the spray vermiculite spray is uh, is applied onto the underside and to directly on top of the carbon fiber itself. <clears throat> uh, recognize that building at all? Structure? It's not far from here. Uh, it's Niagara Falls. Uh, this is a, we're talking a little bit about this at lunch, of heritage structures. And this is a monument uh, dedicated to Sir General Isaac Brock, uh, in the War of 1812, and this structure is uh, masonry and uh, 200 years old. And we are in a seismic climate or seismic zone in this area of the world, albeit very small, but uh, I think maybe uh, two, three, four weeks ago, we had a small tremor in Buffalo, just outside of Buffalo. Uh, so there is, some, there is some seismic activity that does take place around here. This structure was reinforced to uh, comp to strengthen it in the event of uh, seismic activity, and that's all it was. That's all it was about. So, in the middle of this column, there is a staircase, a spiral staircase that goes just one way up and one way down. So, they undertook a program of of uh, restoring the outside of it, but also all the way up the two hundred and so feet of the the height of that structure. Uh, they put the plate system on uh, on spacings every every uh, twenty inches or so uh, throughout the uh, stair spiral staircase all the way up. And again, it was strictly to uh, flexurally strength or basically stiffen the the whole structure so that in the event of a shaking, uh, it will keep its structural integrity intact a little better than if they did nothing. The project in North Bay. Uh, this is a heavy duty uh, application of uh, uh, applying the carbon fiber on the underside of the slab to basically increase the structural capacity of the two way slab. The, the facility itself was a Canada Post sorting facility, uh, 30, 40 year old structure. The weight of the packages 30, 40 years ago was not what it was to uh, what it is today. Uh, the engineers deemed that uh, this was not uh, structurally sufficient, and uh, we basically went into a very highly congested area with HVAC and, and plumbing equipment, and were able to manipulate the, the transfer of the product onto the ceiling. And then at the end of the day, 
Uh, we have a grid pattern here and a two-way slab up structurally upgraded with the use of the carbon fiber. Okay, I mentioned that one of the beauties of this product, if you're trying to get a steel beam up into that cavity, that'd be next to impossible. Uh, this was uh, 15, 12 feet long in, in, in length. We deposited the, the epoxy onto the, pro onto the product and onto the uh, ceiling as I showed earlier. And then they basically, two or three people would carry the material through that congestion and get it onto the surface, uh, under the underside of the surface. Can't see it very well there, but there it is uh, through all that uh, congestion and mess. Okay, so that's the plate, the wrap system. Uh, a few examples uh, back to Toronto. We are uh, looking at a building uh, that uh, Louis Vuitton, a high-end retailer, moved into the corner of, of that building beside the church. And uh, when they moved in, they one of the first things that they mentioned to the engineering community and the owners is that they wanted to knock out the mezzanine floor. Because when you walked into that building, they wanted a, you know, all the high ceilings and the big wow factor when you came in. So they undertook a program to knock that, that mezzanine slab out right in here. There it was all knocked out. There it goes. Bye-bye. And in doing so, you change the structural dynamics of that structure, of the entire building. So uh, right adjacent to the slab that's been taken out, there was a heavy congestion of a wrap system. So we used it. We could have used the plates here, but this is the versatility of the wraps, is we could use the wraps on the underside as well. So those wraps were uh, a foot in width and of various lengths and they would basically place one wrap on top of the other and they actually wind up having five different layers of uh, of that wrap system on the underside so it was a very heavy heavy structural upgrade and reinforcing that was able to be accomplished by uh with the system uh, after taking out uh, the dynamics of that slab same thing happened on the top side same same structure but we did the each of those widths there are, uh, are a foot in width or 300 millimeters in width. And again, there's multiple of them on top of each other. So you'd have five layers for each one of those lines. Okay, the process is similar to what uh, we showed earlier. This is a little bit different. So these are what we call pre-cured products. They are, uh, they, are um, uh, they come in that fabric, uh, like the wallpaper. So you need to encapsulate that with an epoxy layer uh, before it goes onto the surface. So what we've got in this illustration here is we've got the epoxy adhesive going on on the, on the underside of the slab, and then the uh, epoxy going onto the actual fabric itself, and then that would go onto, this, onto the surface. So now he's basically unrolling it. I think that might be a video. It works. Nope, never mind. So uh, at the at the ends of this, uh, the extremities in here, we want to resist the peeling that uh, forces that that are inherent, and we do that with a stitching technique. Uh, I won't get into this too in too much in too in depth, but uh, you can see the three lines that are that are taking place here. Uh, what's happened? There's a, a drill, a, a hole that was drilled into there. Once the fabric goes up. They basically take these uh, these uh, small strips of the carbon fiber themselves and insert it into the hole and, and fan it out and and they marry the uh, the uh, anchors into the uh, into the fabric itself. Okay, so that's what's happening in that example. Okay, we talked about the spray. So here's an example of wrapping of a column, which uh, is very common. Uh, this is a water reservoir in Hamilton where the roof structure was 50 years old, uh, in need of repair, uh, a lot of cracks in that concrete, a lot of, uh, a lot of compromised concrete, and they elected to reinstate a new roof on top of it. Uh, so there's precast, and then there's a grouting in between the precast, pre pre and in doing so, you're adding a tremendous amount of dead load onto that structure. That dead load is supported by the columns within the within the water reservoir itself, and those water and those columns uh, needed to be upgraded as a result of the increased dead load. And so we basically took the carbon fiber wrap and wallpapered it all the way around the column and all the way up. 
Uh, there were a hundred and some odd, uh, 130 columns that were wrapped in this fashion for the structural upgrade. Okay, this is our drinking water. So uh, we had uh, protective coatings that would that would be applied uh, after the fact. And uh, these are um, NSF or National Sanitation Foundation the flat compliant coatings that we would apply over top afterwards. Okay, so this is just illustrating the uh, the epoxy layer. It's almost like a ketchup consistency that's being spread out onto the column, and then uh, and then the the wrap uh, is encaps is uh, put into the epoxy, and uh, and they basically uh, that's the the simple method of, of of applying that product. Okay, if you wanted to install uh, the coating afterwards, there's a product called. Uh, peel ply, which can be applied onto the the, the wrap, so that uh, once you take this material off, you can uh, it fil fil uh, facilitates a, a surface that is conducive to applying an epoxy product over top to get a good bond. And there, that's that's what we had happen on on that epoxy afterwards. I'm going to turn it over to, I think that illustrates most of these are, this is again, seismic upgrading. This was a hotel in St. Catharines. Uh, they added five floors onto this structure. And again, being uh, this was seismic consideration. There's the before picture in the upper right, more floors added and throughout the entire corridor and the and the structure it, within that, uh, that building, uh, we added the, uh, these carbon fibers into the, into the, into the wall system. And that basically extended from the basement all the way up to the fourth floor, fifth floor. Okay, and then bridges. Uh, so, Sebastian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. Just Okay, so Bruce just gave you a really good idea of what we can do with our FRP materials, so fiber and post polymer, like different type of application. Mm -hmm. I'm just I I just gonna present you like technologies we'd like to push a bit more, you know. Uh, Starting with the Sika Carbodio Road. So uh, Bruce already showed you some uh, some examples of application. Uh, the most important things uh, with this system is that you are going to be in the concrete. So that's the beauty. Uh, instead of having a large surface preparation to install Carbodio plates or Sika wrap fabrics, here you are just like creating a small groove into the concrete, and then you can fill the groove uh, with one of our epoxy material. So at Sika, we have plenty of options as uh, epoxy resin. So if you are working on a horizontal and flat surface, we have like on consistency resin that can be poured into the groove after you install the carbodio rods, I mean. If you are working with a small slope on horizontal surface, it's better to have like a more tixotropic material. So we have reasons for that. Same thing if you are working on a vertical surface, if you want to stitch some cracks, for example, on a concrete wall. So quickly, the advantages of uh, this solution. So FRP materials are non-corrosive material compared to steel. So that's the reason why we can put them in the cover of the, of the concrete. They are not going to be affected by the by the corrosion process. Um, at Sika, we always recommend to follow the national or international design code. So the ACI 440, Bruce mentioned this code earlier. Uh, it gives all the dimensions of the groove based on the on the on the diameter of the groove. So. Everything is explained in the code, and Sika is following the code for the design and the application. And normally, there is no risk to cut rebars uh, in the country. But as Bruce was saying, it's uh, you have to check. I mean, the engineers have to check first if you 
are not too 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 close to the rebar just in case because we don't want to damage the concrete structure uh, before reinforcing it. So yeah, that's pretty the idea to put the resin into the groove and then install the carbon rods in the groove. Just gonna show you a few project references because I'm gonna talk later about uh, a software that we have at Sika uh, that can be used to do the design. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you two examples and uh, the engineer used the Carbodio software to do the design of this project. So this is a project, uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, sorry. Uh, this is a parking, outside parking. Uh, they wanted to increase the, the, the moment capacity of, of the slab. So they just used the Carbodio roads, they created some group. And the beauty with this system is you can go, you, you finish flush with the concrete. You don't have any difference of level at the top surface of the concrete. So you can come uh, after and put uh, like a, a protection, waterproofing, anything you want. So in this case, they were about to put a hot asphalt on top of that. The only thing is you have to protect the epoxy that is used to fill the grooves. So that's the reason why they decided to, uh, on top of the groove, to install a Sika protective mortar, like just 15 millimeter thick, just to protect during the the application of the of the asphalt. So my computer. Another project in New Brunswick. Uh, that's a bridge in this case. So negative moment correction, they use the Carbodio software to do the entire design. Uh, this project is pretty massive. So they wanted to uh, enhance the, the bridge capacity. So they are going to use like 420 pieces of Carbodio rods. So they are going to install that very soon on the bridge. Uh, as there is a slope, they decided to go with a uh, like a tixotropic uh, resin, which is a Cicadio 330. I'm not gonna go too deep into the detail with the product, but uh, that's what they are going to do. And they decided to go a bit deeper to put the protective mortar into the groove as well, to make sure to finish flush with the concrete and go with uh, the attach bolt on top of that. Another example, and I like to to, to talk about it. Uh, it's in France, in France, sorry, south of France, Monaco. Uh, they decided to use the Carbonio roads to stitch some cracks. Uh, the only thing they didn't pay attention, the cracks uh, went through the slab at some areas, and the resin, the Cicadio resin, the epoxy resin, just leaked through the cracks uh, through the slab and uh, fell, <coughs> fell down a beautiful Maserati uh, sports car, so underneath. So the contractor had a lot of problem because of the car and not because of the, the application of our products. And then quickly, I'm gonna talk about uh, this new system. Uh, we are going, we are trying actually to push uh, to introduce this system in, in Canada. This is an additional pre-stressing. So we are going to put some tension, tension on the carbodio plates. <clears throat> so with this type of system, we are not going to uh, do some application in buildings, but mainly in a civil engineering uh, application. The idea, so the system is called Sika Carbo Stress. Uh, we are using only one carbodio plate, very specific. Bruce was mentioning that our carbodio plates are 1.2 millimeter thick. This one is 2.6 millimeter thick because we are going to, to put some tension on. So we need a thicker plate just to make sure it's not gonna uh, it's not gonna crack and, uh, and and break. So for this technology, we are working with a company in Switzerland, uh, Stressed. They are producing the clamping heads that you can see at the very end of the plate that's full composite material, and they are making it uh, at length for each, each project. So they guarantee like a force uh, up to 300 kilonewtons, but for the design, 
we say that you can go up to 220 uh, kilonewton maximum. So the application is pretty simple. Uh, you have a fixed end core and you have a movable end core. So you have to install uh, end cores at each end, and then you are going to put some tension, and that's going to create an, a moment into the structure and help uh, to resist to the loads. Here, we are going to provide an active strengthening compared to the passive strengthening with a simply bonding material because we want to reduce the deflection, the stresses in the, in the rebars, also in the concrete. Uh, that's going to close also the cracks of a, big, of a uh, building and increase the stiffness. Just about the application, the idea is to define the location of the rebar, drill a hole to make sure to be able to install the anchorage uh, uh, at each end of the, of the concrete structure. We use one of our products to inject the anchoring part. And then you just install the carbon stress system and put some tension. So you have to wait. You cannot go from zero to 200 kilonewton at once. You have to go step by step. I mean, 50 kilonewton, you wait five minutes just to see if the structure is moving or if you are losing some tension and then you put more tension on. Just to finish, uh, we have a project. We did a project that was not in Canada at that time. I was still a student, but uh, we did a project in, a, in, a, in Ottawa on a bridge. Uh, so this bridge was in poor condition and uh, had a lot of cracks. So they decided to, to use the carbon stress system to, uh, to help the bridge to support the loads because of, of traffic on top of that. So they used 36 carbon stress system. And for this project, they decided to bond the carbon, dure, uh, the carbon stress system to the concrete. So uh, now it's done. They cannot come back and put some additional tension on the bridge but the bridge is still there and uh, it's been 10 years now. So it's a really good, really good system. And, uh, and that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Um, so I don't think we'll have time for audience questions, but please feel free to come up afterwards. Um, it's more so that there's people who need to use the room. Okay. Um, yeah. But you guys are okay staying around for a little bit? Absolutely. Okay. Come up for questions. Yeah. Um, I hope you got something out of it. And uh, when uh, when you're out in the field, remember our company. And uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you.